Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we will be continuing with the novel The Dark Forest by Liu Sijin. This is part 4. A link for part 3 will be in the upper right corner and a playlist for the entire series will be at the end of the video. And if you haven't subscribed please consider doing so. Give us a like, drop us a comment and now let's continue with the novel. Zhang Beihai went to meet with Ding Yi at the third nuclear fusion test base. A crucial fusion breakthrough had been achieved and it was because of Ding Yi. And that means that spacecraft research will begin immediately and there are two opposing groups around these two different directions of research. One favors media propelled spacecraft and the other radiation drive spacecraft. Ding Yi and Zhang Beihai both favor the radiation-based spacecraft, but the people in charge of choosing are from the old guard who favor the media-driven spacecraft. And Zhang Beihai thinks that that's a mistake because that type of spacecraft will tie them to planets. And Zhang Beihai needs a spacecraft capable of interstellar travel. so. No matter how dangerous it might be, he'll have to go and get the last choice. Zhang Beihai, who had been approved to be the head of the political reinforcers to be sent to the future and was soon to be put into hibernation, went to visit a meteorite collector from whom he bought three iron meteorites, each about the size of an apple. He then went to a research institute where he cut the meteorites into 36 small meteorite rods. He then turned them into 36 meteorite bullets for a P224 pistol. He then test fired four of them into a hunk of beef and the four meteorite rods shattered completely leaving a small pile of rubble. Grabbing its 32 remaining bullets, he then left to make preparations for his visit to space. In space, around the space elevator terminus was other space facilities, dozens of them. These would one day form the basis of the shipyards that would build a space fleet. Zhang Beihai was hanging in space about 5 kilometers from the Yellow River Station which was a wheel-shaped space station that was 300 kilometers above the space elevator terminus. He had been in space for 3 months living and working with a special contingent of their future reinforcements. They were all living at base 1 which was a space station 80 kilometers away. He had been waiting for an opportunity to eliminate 3 people and that opportunity suddenly presented itself. The aerospace fraction was holding a high level work conference on the Yellow River Station and all of its targets would be attending. A conference was to be held on the Yellow River Station. Before he left Base 1, he had made sure to drop his spacesuit's positioning unit in his cabin so the surveillance system would not be aware that he left the base and there would be no record of his movements. Then using the thrusters on his suit, he flew 80 kilometers through space to the position he had selected and now he was waiting for his opportunity. He wasn't too worried about being detected by the Yellow River Station surveillance system because there were human sized garbage floating around in the area now because of the construction. He watched as a group exited the Yellow River Station. He pulled out his pistol and fired 10 rounds at each of the targets. He had fired a few bullets wide of the mark in the hopes of hitting a few people besides his target that would reduce any suspicion. He watched and confirmed that five people had been hit including his targets. They had been hit at least five times each. The group assumed that they were being hit by meteorites and hightailed it back into the station. And he had killed them because he wanted to ensure that the non-media radiation drive would become the mainstream of spacecraft research. But Zhang Beihai was seen. He was seen by the SOFANS that transmitted that information to members of the ETO that met in the 
defunct tree body game to discuss what they should do about it, but they were told by the Trisolaris to do nothing. The Trisolaris wanted them to remain focused on escapism because they believed that defeatism is more dangerous than triumphalism, which is what they believe Jean Behai to be. When they realized that they couldn't do anything about him and no one would probably believe them anyway, they decided that it was a good thing that he was going to the future so that they could be rid of him. As the special contingent of future reinforcements were headed for the hibernation chamber, Zhang Weixi handed a letter to Zhang Beihai to pass to his future successor when he is awakened. Then Zhang Weixi passed on a last bit of advice and Zhang Beihai hopped into the plane and headed for the hibernation chamber. Eight years later, Wolfaces, Ray Diaz and Heinz were pulled out of hibernation because the technology that they'd been waiting for had finally been developed. All cutting edge physics had stopped, but technology was still being improved, although beginning to slow down. The first person Heinz met when he came out of hibernation was his wife Keiko Yamasuki. She explained to him that she didn't enter hibernation two years after him as promised because she's been working on preparing for their post-hibernation work. She told him how shortly after he went into hibernation, six next-gen supercomputer research projects was launched. Three of them employed traditional architecture, one used non-von Neumann architecture, and the other two were quantum and biomolecular computing projects. The first to be terminated was the quantum computing project because of the Sofon barrier. The next one to be discontinued was the biomolecular project. Then the next to last was the von Neumann computer. The three traditional architecture projects are still ongoing but there haven't been any progress. So what they came up as a workaround was to put software simulation into hardware by using a microprocessor to simulate one neuron. They had to manufacture a hundred billion microprocessors to do it. The original plan was to build 30 virtual brain assembly shops, but they only got one built. They were able to build only one computer and its performance is 10,000 times better than when he went into hibernation eight years ago. She then showed him what that one supercomputer can do by showing him its holographic display. And she used it to show him a holographic display of a brain, her brain. Heinz and Keiko began using subjects hooked up to their computer in an effort to find out where the critical thinking happens in the brain and map it in the supercomputer. And one day while they were doing this, one of their subjects, subject 104, developed a phobia. He began to think that water itself is toxic. And so he refused to drink any water. Apparently, when the subjects are hooked up to the supercomputer, they would be asked a series of propositions and they would have to answer if they were true or false. Well, the final question was, water is toxic? And he answered false, but it seems as if the radiation used affected his brain somehow, causing him to believe that that proposition is true. So they decided to run that experiment again with the same proposition, but this time they're going to perform it on Heinz. At the end of the experiment, Heinz gained the phobia that water is toxic. A little over two months later, Heinz met with Shang Weixi at the top of the Space Command building. There, Heinz told Shang Weixi of an accidental discovery they made, the ability to implant a rock-solid belief in the human mind. If the belief is demonstrably false, then it could be removed from the mind because it took Heinz two months of psychotherapy to be able to drink water properly and without fear and he offered to use that to implant the belief in absolute victory against the Trisolarians in the mind of the military. But Shang Weixi refused him saying after these modifications are people still people or are they automatons? The PDC held its wall facer hearing where Heinz introduced his mental seal 
most of the representatives were against it because they consider it thought control. Heinz basically argued that since the human species and its civilization is facing death, they should use any tool available to them to win. But they were still against it until he proposed a compromise. First, it would be voluntary and it would be only applied to the space force. And the mental seal would have just one proposition, belief in a victory in the war. Finally, the PDC approved it and called the new facility where it would take place, the Faith Center. The Faith Center was located in the UN Plaza and for the first three days, no one came in. Heinz and Keiko were there every day waiting. On the afternoon of the third day, a civilian member of the Space Force came in. The belief he wanted implanted in his brain was that his wife loves him and she has never and will never have an affair. Heinz, of course, kicked him out. After he left, another man came in. It was Wu Yue. He told him that he was a member of the Space Force before he resigned for being a defeatist but that he has since married a woman who is a Christian and who has faith that God will save them in time. So he comes to them hoping that they would give him the belief that God exists and will save them. Heinz explained to him that there is only one proposition that can be implanted and that is faith in victory against the enemy. Just as the man was leaving, Heinz followed him and told him that he himself wanted to implant something and he almost did but at the last minute stopped himself and the belief he wanted to implant in himself was God is dead. When he was asked why, he said, isn't it obvious? Isn't God dead? Screw the Lord's plan. After that, the next day, four space officers came in and had the belief implanted in them. Then more and more space officers began coming in so that they can believe in victory. Heinz and Keiko went back to Japan to stay for a little while before they headed for hibernation with the intent of waking up 400 years in the future. Six months later, as Keiko was being put under, her thoughts crystallized and everything became clear and she tried to stop the hibernation but it was too late. Hibernation continued as scheduled. They finally had computers that was able to model and manufacture the high yield stellar hydrogen bombs. The first bomb that they manufactured was going to be a 350 megaton bomb. The bomb because of its size had to be tested in space and not too close to the earth. The PDC wanted to test it on the back side of the moon but Ray Diaz wanted to test it on Mercury. When he was asked why he wanted to use a nuke on Mercury, he said that he wanted to use the bomb to create a cave on Mercury and that cave would become a military base and that would be and that base would be the place of last resistance for humanity. When asked how many bombs does he want, he said he wanted a million but he will settle for as much as possible. The US, the UK and France voted to terminate his plan. With the PDC narrowly approving Ray Diaz's plan for Mercury, work soon began. The original plan was to dig a shaft and then put the bomb in the bottom of it and set it off. That was supposed to take three years, but they soon ran into a problem. As it was digging down, they ran into a layer of metal and rock that was incredibly tough and trying to dig through it would have extended the time and the expense so they decided to terminate the project. But Ray Diaz insisted that they use the length of shaft that they had. So when the bomb was finally detonated, it sent enough material into space that it created a ring around Mercury, a thin ring. And some of the rock achieved escape velocity and formed an extremely sparse asteroid belt in Mercury's orbit. Ray Diaz watched the detonation of the bomb on Mercury from the safety of his basement bunker. He got a call from the PDC leadership saying that the leadership was impressed and the permanent members wanted to hold a wall facing meeting as soon as possible to discuss the bomb's manufacture and deployment. About 10 hours later, Ray Diaz received a visitor who claimed to be a psychiatrist that can cure him from his condition. 
once the man was let in, he announced himself to be Rediaz's wall breaker. The wall breaker admitted that for three years they couldn't figure out what Rediaz's plan was. So finally, he had to begin investigating Rediaz's past before he became a wall facer. And he noticed that when he was still president of Venezuela, he met with William Cosmo. Once the tri-solar crisis began, Dr. Cosmo's research team began studying the atmosphere of the trisolarian stellar system, specifically that a planet may have impacted one of the stars in that system. So to prove their hypothesis, they searched for another star that had a planet that had impacted it. To compare. And they found one and was able to observe when the planet hit the star that material was ejected from the star. And he says that's when he figured out where Diaz's plan when he put it all together. Diaz's plan is to set a million bombs into the crater that was created on Mercury and then at the proper time detonate them. They will cause Mercury to fall into the sun which will cause some of the sun's material to be ejected into space. That ejection will of course cause the next three planets, Venus, Earth and Mars, to follow the same fate as Mercury and they will spiral into the sun, which will cause more material to be ejected from the sun, which eventually will reach out to the orbit of Jupiter and Jupiter and its moons will most likely follow the same faith. It would end all life in the solar system, but it would also be a death blow for the Trisolarians because they have nowhere else to go. Because their home planet will also be destroyed one day when it falls into their sun. So Diaz's plan is to get everything set up and then use it against the Trisolarians as a mad strategy, mutual assured destruction, and force them to surrender. After listening to him speak, Ray Diaz then attacked the wall breaker, knocking out several of his teeth and almost strangling him to death. Ray Diaz's guards came in and stopped him from killing the wall breaker. The ETO, of course, had published Ray Diaz's secret plan. So at the PDC's next wall face hearing, the US, the UK, France and Germany put in a proposition demanding the immediate suspension of Ray Diaz's position as a wall facer and his crime before the International Court of Justice for Crimes Against Humanity. When it seems as if the PDC was going to strip Diaz of his wall facer status and his immunity and the US having CIA agents outside waiting to arrest him and to try him for crimes against humanity, he showed them his wristwatch, which was twice as large and thicker than a normal wristwatch. And he said this is a transmitter sending a signal through a space link directly to Mercury. He told them it was sending a signal, a continuous signal, through several communication relays to a spot right here in New York City. The PDC, of course, had no choice but to let him leave and go back to his country. And as he left the UN, Garanin, who was the rotating chairman of the PDC, went outside with him. That's when Radias told him that the watch is just a simple transmitter. There's no bomb or anything waiting. He then handed the watch to Garanin. They then flew six hours to Caracas. Radias got off the plane. Garanin didn't. He flew back to the UN. His motorcade took him into the city of Caracas. He went to the Plaza Bolivar and there there was a crowd of people waiting for him and as he got out and began to speak to them, they began to stone him. In the end, they stoned him to death. They did that because they thought that his plan was to kill everyone along with the Trisolarians. Shang Wei-si retired the same year as the Mercury test. He admitted that he had no confidence in victory in his final speech. He died at the age of 68, mentioning Zhang Behai's name. General Secretary Se, after leaving her second term in office, launched the Human Memorial Project. One of its most influential components was the Human Diary, a website set up to allow as many people as possible to record their lifetimes in the form of text and images. It would grow to have more than 2 billion users, but the PDC, believing that it contributed to defeatism, passed the resolution stopping its further development and even equating it to escapism. But Se continued to work on it until she died at age 84. 
Gavinin and Kent retired and went to live in the same place where Luoji lived for five years. They were never seen again by the outside world and nobody knows when they died. Wu Yue was depressed for the rest of his life and died at 77. Dr. Ringier and General Fitzroy lived into the 80s and got to see the Hubble Treat Space Telescope completed. Mia Fuquan died at 75. Zhang Yanxiao died at 80. Yang Jin Wen died at 92 and his remains was blasted out of the solar system. Ding Yi reached his 70s before he went into hibernation. He tried to find a way around the so far interference but never did. He wanted to wake up at the doomsday battle so he could see the Trisolarian technology for himself. Over the next hundred years, everyone who lived through the golden age passed away and the young people of that time would remember this era as a fabled time when there was peace, prosperity and happiness and they would wonder if it really ever existed. I will stop here. There will be a part 5 in an upcoming video. I want to thank everyone for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment and I will see you in the next video.